So today I'm gonna to be talking about everything you should know before buying an E92 M3. I'm gonna go over some various options that were available and also some common problems that most of you are probably familiar with, but gonna add a little bit more context as to maybe why they fail, when they're supposed to fail, or when they typically fail, I should say, and also the cost it is to replace it before you are to buy one of these cars, either an E92 M3, and this also applies to the E90 and E93 M3. So we can just refer to it as the E9X M3 since it applies to the E90, 92, and 93. So everything you should know before buying an E9X M3. Before we get started, if you guys enjoy these types of videos, please hit that like button. It really helps me out a lot and drop a comment down below and consider subscribing if you wanna see more of these types of videos, more POV videos. I have a lot of stuff coming. So stay tuned for that. All right, let's get into it. The E92 M3 was produced from 2008 to 2013. My car here is a 2013 example. And then also before I forget, the E90 M3, which is the four-door version of this car, the E90 was produced from 2008 to 2011. So there are no 2012 or 13 E90s M3s. Just wanna put that out there before I, of course, lose track of that. Uh, but anyways, the first thing I want to get into is the competition package. So for these cars, starting in 2011, they started offering the competition package. And this is something that you guys may want to consider. For me, I did want the competition package, but after the rabbit hole that I went down, I ended up modifying the car a decent amount. So for me, the competition package wasn't that useful in the end, just because what it comes with is different wheels and i'll throw a picture up on the screen right now so you can see what those wheels look like so these are the competition package wheels and then in addition to that it also came with edc edc is the suspension electronic dampening control uh, i ended up changing my suspension anyways i'm running olin's coilovers right now so my point being if you guys are looking to modify the car if you're going to change the suspension or if you're going to change the wheels competition package isn't that necessary for you guys to get when you guys are searching for your E92 M3. Another feature of the competition package is it does lower the car by 10 millimeters. To be honest, it's, it's really not that much, at least in my opinion. Uh, you guys can see how much lower my car is right now. Again, that's because I'm running coilovers, not the regular standard EDC suspension. So my point being, like I said, if you guys are looking to modify the car, competition package is not a necessary item that you guys need to get but it may be something that you do want to get in the meantime while your car is stock while you're in the process of building it or if you're planning on keeping it stock definitely consider getting the competition package so next up what I want to talk about is actually the roof of these cars so as you guys can see right here my car is equipped with the full carbon fiber roof so for the E92 M3 you could get a slick top with the moonroof option or you could get what I have here, the carbon roof. For the E90 M3, it only came with a slick top or a slick top with the moon roof. So only two options. So the E90 M3 did not have the option for the carbon roof. However, there are some third party companies that have retrofitted carbon roofs onto the E90 M3. It is not the same roof that is on my car. It's different proportions. So you can't just take an E92 roof and put it on an E90 M3, it won't work. But you can get them third party if you do want an E90 M3 with a carbon roof. And then lastly, I'll just briefly touch on the E93 M3. So E93, it should be straightforward. Only one option since it's a full on convertible. So you only have one option for your roof for the E93. So next up, we are going to move to the interior of the car. We're gonna talk about the transmission options. So for my car, I have the manual equipped. So this is a six speed manual. And for some that may not know a ton about these cars, it does not have auto rev match, which some people have accused me of having or retrofitting on my uh, Instagram videos or YouTube videos. This does not have auto rev match. That's something that I would never want to have on a car like this. I want to, you know, be able to do everything myself. So anyways, thanks for the kind compliments. If you guys think it does have auto rev match, uh, that just shows that I guess I can decently rev match, make it sound like a DCT. So which moves me to the next option for the car, which is the DCT transmission, which is, uh, it's not an automatic, but for simple terms, it's, it's an automatic. It's called a dual clutch transmission. There's no right transmission for this car. A lot of people say the DCT is the way to go and the car was designed for DCT and that very well may be so. Uh, I just prefer the manual. 
The DCT is still an unbelievably good transmission. You cannot go wrong with either option. Just in my personal opinion, I just prefer the manual. Uh, I have driven DCTs and I'll tell you, you guys really can't go wrong. The DCT is an amazing transmission. Anyways, really up to you guys. Can't go wrong with either transmission. I love both transmissions. It's just for my personal car, I did want to get the manual transmission just because it, for me, is a little bit more engaging. But again, can't go wrong with either. DCT is an amazing transmission, as is the 6MT. So next up, we are going to talk about the infotainment system on these cars. So you guys may hear this being referred to as single hump versus du uh, dual or double hump. I think they call it dual hump. Double hump sounds a little bit weird. Anyways, uh, they refer to it as single or dual hump because this is one and that's two. So my car is a dual hump, which most cars are. Uh, you'll hear some people on the forums talking about a quote unquote stripper model, which basically means a single hump and like no options. Uh, not really a big fan of stripper models, uh, for this car at least. In other cars, sure, like a GT3, that would be pretty cool. But for me, I never really wanted a quote unquote stripper. I wanted something that was just usable all the time. I like having the infotainment in this car. So basically, without getting on a huge tangent, the single hump is just the cluster right here, and it does not have an infotainment system. So you'll see a single hump is like this, and then it's smooth the whole way. So this next part only applies to cars that are dual hump, like my car here, that has the infotainment system. So in 2008, they had the old iDrive module, and my god, it's, it's hideous. But the 2009 and up has the updated iDrive. So it looks a little bit like this. This is the homepage of the new, newer iDrive. Uh, you can also retrofit the iDrive to get Apple CarPlay in this car, if that's something that you like. Uh, I do like Apple CarPlay, it's just I've never really felt the need to get it in this car just because every time I drive this car, it's usually some place that I've already been before, so I don't really need to use maps that often. Plus, I just want to focus on driving the car and enjoying it rather than having, you know, something really intricate in the center. That's just my preference. I think Apple CarPlay still looks great. Uh, just wanted to throw that out there in case you know you are hesitant about getting you know quote unquote old tech in this car. You can retrofit the iDrive to get Apple CarPlay, whatever you want. So also sticking in the interior, the last thing I want to touch on is an option called extended leather. So right here you can see that this is all leather on my car. It comes down here and then also on the passenger side it comes down into their footwell as well. And then I believe this is also part of the extended leather. So on cars that don't have extended leather, it's a different material like this. It's this plasticky material. I do want to get rid of this someday and get a, uh, a leather dash, but that's not really on my uh, high priority to-do list. But anyways, uh, going back to the extended leather, the extended leather option just basically adds leather here. Oops, it adds leather here on the center console and then also right here in like the footwell areas on both driver and passenger side. Not a must-have option for everyone. Uh, I did want it though, just because I like the look of it better. Uh, but this is something that you probably will never really notice. Then a couple other things that I don't really want to spend a lot of time on, but I'll mention it really quickly just so you guys can look into it more. So some of these cars came with headlight washers, which basically are a little bump that sticks out like right here. Uh, I hated those, so obviously I didn't want that on my car. And then also the 2008 model year was the only one that had a keyhole in the trunk that is about right here. Uh, all the other cars do not have a keyhole to open the trunk, only the 08 model did. This car is an LCI, so it's called Life Cycle Impulse. So this has the updated tail lights. Um, some of the older models, like the 08, 09, will have older tail lights. A lot of people started uh, taking those older cars and putting these newer tail lights on it just to freshen up the rear. So look out for that as well. So now with the bulk of that stuff done, I want to move on to the common issues that this car has since uh, there are some infamous ones like the rod bearings and also throttle actuators and you know, I'll go down the list. There's a couple things that I do want to touch on. So before I get into the common issues with this car along with some prices that you guys should expect to pay in order to fix these common problems, I do want to preface this by saying 
This is all prices that are at the time of filming this video, which is in 2021. So if you guys are watching this a year, two years, three years later, you know, prices are subject to change due to various factors such as the parts being becoming more expensive or just inflation in general driving up prices. And also I want to make this one really clear. This is just a slight range of prices, uh, typically on the West Coast, specifically in California. Uh, I'm gonna, you know, do my best to try and estimate what it would cost outside. But again, I'm not a mind reader or a guru. So on the East Coast, I've heard there's some crazy prices for some stuff. So just keep that in mind, depending on where you live, is also a huge factor on what you are going to have to pay for some of these services, unless you live, you know, in Los Angeles, where typically we have the cheapest prices, luckily. So first up, we are going to start with the infamous rod bearings. And this is a topic that so many people disagree on, have differing opinions. I'm gonna share my opinion and you're free to disagree and formulate your own opinion, but I believe the original rod bearings should be changed within 60 to 80K miles. Again, this is something that needs to be done preventatively. You cannot wait for rod bearings to quote unquote go out because the second they go out, you're either spinning a bearing, which is gonna scratch the crankshaft, which again means your engine is toast, or you're actually gonna shoot a rod out of the block and you're gonna blow your engine. So rod bearings are not something that you can mess with on this car. It's not something you can wait for them to go out. So these need to be done preventatively. There are people on the forums and people that brag online saying that, you know, they're on original bearings, they're going 100K strong, 120, 140K strong, and I believe it. You know, it can happen. It just all depends how you drive the car and a lot of different factors that can contribute to the wear on the car. Um, I just don't think this is something you should mess with. So just because someone has done 140K on their original rod bearings doesn't mean that you should do it as well and take that risk because they could be driving much differently than you do, whether it be street driving, highway driving, canyon driving, track driving, you never know. And one more note on this high mileage original bearing thing. There was one story I heard of this guy that was, you know, boasting about how he has 120, 140K on his, on his original bearings. And then he finally came around to doing his bearings just because he was like one of the highest mileage ones out there come to find out his bearings were already done by the previous owner. So this whole time while he's boasting about being on original bearings, he actually had BE bearings in his car from the original owner. So again, you cannot believe everything that you guys hear online. Uh, me personally, because of the way I drive this car, I you know, tend to enjoy it a little bit in the canyons. Um, I only have 34,000 miles right now and I got my rod bearings done at about 30, 30 31,000 miles. Uh, just due to the nature of the way I drive this car, of course I always let it get up to temp, but you know, I probably could stretch it to, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60,000 miles just because of the way I drive very aggressively. But again, I just didn't wanna take the risk because I love this car, I love making content for you guys. So I just wanted to get it done and have some peace of mind. So for this car, the E9X M3, there were actually two different bearing types. So in the earlier models, which were about 08 to about mid 2010, they call these the 10.5s. These were the older bearings, which are the 088 and 089 bearings. So these ones were made of a multi-layer material. It had some copper and like zinc or something. I, I can't remember all of the, um, the different metals and then in the newer cars which is what my car came with initially is the 702 703 bearings and these bearings entered about mid 2010 production year so they call these like the 10.5 plus so basically anything from 2011 plus should have these newer bearings and then one more thing to touch on about the bearings a lot of people tend to do oil analysis on this car if you have a 2011 or above just save your money because these newer bearings were made with a full aluminum construction and there's going to be aluminum in your oil regardless uh, if you have the older bearings so you have an earlier car the 2008 2009 and early 2010s you can do an oil analysis since you will be able to see different levels of copper which should obviously never be in the oil but you can tell what layer the bearings have worn down because it has a multi-layer but these newer ones save your money because there's going to be aluminum in the oil regardless since the motor is made of aluminum so you can't really tell what is 
come straight from the bearings that's aluminum and what's come from the motor that's aluminum. I would just suggest save your money and just get the bearings done. Don't waste your time on doing oil analysis if you have one of the newer cars, but if you have an earlier car, you can do oil analysis. It will be beneficial. So for the rod bearing service, I think you should generally plan to pay anywhere from about $2,300 to about $2,800 uh, in California. That's pretty much only considering like Los Angeles and San Francisco, but uh, elsewhere you can pay easily upwards of $3,000 and on the East Coast I've heard of places, you know, four or $5,000. And this is also due to the lack of competition in those areas as well. Um, and then in addition to that also just, they may not have as much experience with working on these cars. So it may take them longer to do the rod bearing job. So AKA more book time. So it's not like they're always trying to you know, pull a fast one on you uh, on the East Coast. It's just, they may take longer just because they don't have as much experience working on these cars. So that's just the way it is. Luckily in California, we have it a little bit better. Uh, but yeah, about 2,300 to 2,800 is a fair price to change the rod bearings on these cars. And it'll also change based on the type of bearings that you put in the car. Please guys, the one thing I cannot stress this enough, you need to get extra clearance bearings. Do not change your rod bearings with these, you know, quote unquote stock ones, either the uh, WPC treated or the older bearings. That doesn't solve the issue. It's just gonna come back again. So please get aftermarket bearings with extra clearance. All right, next up on the common problems list is the throttle actuators. So throttle actuators for this car, they typically tend to go out anywhere from 60,000 to 100,000 miles. I was one of the examples that uh, had it go out a little bit earlier. Uh, they went out about 34,000 miles on this car. So this is something that I actually just fixed a few months ago. I got unlucky, unfortunately, but it is what it is. And for throttle actuators, you guys should expect to spend anywhere from about 1,900 to about $2,500 to get this service done. It's a little bit cheaper than the rod bearings, so that's a little bit nicer, but again, still a somewhat expensive service. Alrighty, next up, we're gonna talk about the fuel breather valve. This is something that doesn't go out all the time, but it does pop up here and there for some of these cars. So fuel breather valve, you should typically spend about, probably about 500 to a thousand dollars. Again, not something that's super, super common, but one of the more frequent failures that uh, does happen here and there. Next up, we're gonna talk about the idle control valve. Again, this is something that can go out here and there, and you should typically spend about $1,100 to $1,700 on this fix. The sign of an idle control valve going out is usually a rough idle at a stoplight or after you start up the car. Uh, I think my friend Justin is actually experiencing this issue right now. We get to a stoplight and sometimes his car will actually just shut off, but his idle will lope, so it'll go like vroom, vroom. Okay, and then the last one that I do wanna mention that is a typical fix for these cars is the valve cover gaskets. So they sometimes can leak. Um, you just gotta check them and just make sure that they're not leaking. Uh, but typically valve cover gaskets, you should expect to spend about 900 to $1,500 on this fix. It does happen in the higher mileage cars. Uh, I haven't had to do it yet, but that is something that you should look out for. So as a recap of all of these common problems for the E92 M3, this is something that you guys need to be aware of while you're searching for one because these common issues will typically happen with age. Uh, it also depends on how the previous owner was driving the car. So if you guys are getting a higher mileage example, something into 60, 80, 100,000 mile range, this is something that you really need to uh, budget for since if it hasn't been done yet, you need to plan to get that done. Uh, if you're getting a lower mileage car, like one like mine, $30,000, $40,000, you have a little bit more time, but again, it's still something that you need to budget for in the future because they will eventually happen if you do keep the car for a decent amount of time. So these are pretty much all the common failures or issues with this car. The only thing that you need to do really preventatively is the rod bearings. You cannot wait for them to go out because you will blow your motor. Uh, all the other stuff, you can wait for them to go out. It's not really recommended, but you know, if your throttle actu actuators go out, it's just gonna put your car pretty much into limp mode. Um, as you guys saw in the video that I made on my throttle actuators. Um, and also to preface, the only issues I've had with this car 
was the throttle actuators. So I did the rod bearings preventatively, throttle actuators went out on me, but I haven't had to do the fuel breather valve, have not had to do the idle control valve, and I have not had to do the valve cover gaskets. So throttle actuators for me is the only issue I've had with the car, but again, my car has 34,000 miles, so it really shouldn't have any issues whatsoever. So the next couple things I wanna to touch on are basically the platform and also your future plans for the car. This is pretty much just gonna be a recap of some of the stuff that I've said previously and also helping you identify, you know, what kind of car you want and, you know, whether this is the right car for you. So one thing a lot of people do on these cars is supercharging. Uh, supercharging sounds crazy on these cars. It's pretty cool, uh, but in my opinion, it you know, accelerates the wear on the car due to the, you know, boost that it's throwing into the engine that it wasn't supposed to have in the beginning. So for me, it, I just see it as too much accelerated wear and I've seen some failures. And again, correlation isn't causation. So I can't say for certain it was the superchargers. I like superchargers, but I wouldn't really want to put one on my car. Uh, if I wanted a faster car, I'd probably just get a different car. Just in my opinion, I just feel more comfortable keeping this car NA, plus I think I'd prefer it NA, uh, but again, that's just me. The one thing to also consider is if you guys are going to track this car, if you are, I would recommend you guys consider keeping this car NA, since there are some people who have supercharged their cars, started tracking, had some issues with heat management, and ended up going back to NA. Um, there are some people that have tracked their car supercharged, so, you know, it can be done. It's just something that I want to flag to you guys since there are some people that have supercharged their cars and actually went back to NA for the track. I can't really give too much insight into this since I don't know that many people that have supercharges that are tracking and et cetera, et cetera. So this is something that you guys are gonna have to formulate your own opinion on, but figured I would just throw it out there so you guys can look into it. Then kind of on that same note about supercharging and just power in general, if you guys are chasing power, this really is not the car for you. You can get a lot more power out of a 335 or more reliable power out of a B58 motor, so either the A90 Supra or a 340i. Those are much better platforms to get power out of. Um, this this just really isn't, isn't that type of car. You can get power out of it, but really only so much as putting a supercharger on it, and that pretty much puts it at the limit. Um, otherwise you're gonna talk about, you know, fully built motor. But if you are watching this video, chances are you are very interested in the E92 M3. So if you're power hungry, nothing wrong with that. But if you're watching this video and you're power hungry, then, you know, you may still wanna get this car, supercharge it, keep it for a year or two, enjoy it, figure out it's not fast enough for you and then sell it. But at least you still enjoyed it and got the chance to own one. That would just be my, my recommendation. If, you know, you do like a lot of power, then, you know, you may not be satisfied with this car. But this car is great if you like having more of an experience driving the car. For me personally, I think it's a perfect blend of enough power to have fun with, uh, but it's not scary, like it's gonna kill you every time. Um, it's just all usable power, uh, which is something that I really wanted. I enjoy driving this car in the canyons. I don't wanna be scared 24 seven. I'll get another car in the future that may scare me all the time, but this is a, this car is more about the experience rather than just pure sheer power. So that's my outlook on it. Um, you guys can, you know, determine if that's the same car or type of experience you're looking for, or if you want something more straight line and just crazy power, then, you know, consider getting a newer Supra or a 340i. They make a shit ton of power and I've heard that it's pretty reliable power, at least a lot more reliable than the N54s. So that's pretty much gonna wrap up everything that I wanted to talk about here. I talked about uh, some of the options that you guys should look for when purchasing this car, also some common issues along with some prices that you guys should expect to pay. And sorry if I skimmed through that, but you know, I tried to make this video a bit more concise. If you guys want more details on the rod bearings or also the throttle actuators, I made videos on both of those, so you can watch those. Links are in the description if you want some more in detail uh, information about those two services. And then also the other services that I mentioned, they don't happen too often. I uh, haven't made any videos on those, but you can probably find some info on the forums or something. So if your future plans are to do a decent amount of modifications, you're gonna go down the rabbit hole that I did. 
uh, you know, changing the suspension, wheels, exhaust, all of this. You don't need to get the perfect spec per se. Uh, there's just a couple things that you may want to consider, like the carbon roof, which is something that you know you don't really want to retrofit. You might as well just get it from the beginning. Um, but again, if you are going to change the wheels, suspension, and all this other stuff, you don't need the competition package. You just need you know a base car to get you started, and then you can build you know something like this. If you guys enjoyed this video, please hit that like button. It helps me out so much. Uh, to continue making these types of videos and also the POV videos. And if you guys watched this far, comment down below knowledge. If you know, you know. All right, offloading some knowledge. But a couple last things, you know, obviously you guys are gonna be able to decide for yourself if the time is right for you to get this car based on your financial situation. Uh, as much as I, you know, wanna encourage everyone to go out and get this car and, you know, enjoy it as much as possible. Just please make sure that you guys, you know, are investing and saving money and securing your financial future before you buy something like this because it's going to take money to maintain this car and it's going to hurt a lot more if you get this car, have all these big fixes to do, can't afford it and have to sell the car. So just make sure you guys are in a good position to buy this car, invest, put it off a little bit. It's just going to make it that much better when you, when you guys do get the car because you're gonna have, you know, waited a little bit of time and uh, made sure you guys are ready for it. Again, guys, if you did enjoy this video, please hit that like button and consider subscribing if you guys wanna stay up to date on all the newest videos. I have a ton of POV content that is uh, ready to be offloaded onto YouTube, so stay tuned for that. And then last thing here, some of you may already know, but I opened up a website. So I'm carrying some of uh, the parts that I have on this car on the website. So you can buy exhausts, you can buy the flex fuel kit, you can get headlights, you can get a lot of different stuff. Uh, I'm adding to it as always. So just be on the lookout for new products to arrive. It's not gonna be a crazy, you know, website with all of these different products, but it's gonna be a select offering of products that I pretty much have on my car that I have firsthand experience with and can confidently recommend to you guys. So check it out, link is in the description, shopwet.com. Find your products there and uh, inquire for any special requests. I always have discount codes active on the website because I want to give back to you guys who have supported me so much throughout my journey in building this car. And this is really just the beginning. I'm excited to see where this car takes me um, and what I can do in the future. So discount codes are always active on the website. Shoot me an email to get more information on that or to inquire about a product or inquire about a special request. So I'm always available. I want to give back to you guys. So consider checking out shopwet.com. You guys have supported me so much throughout this journey. So I appreciate that. I really do. I'm not just saying it. It's crazy to see what a car has brought into my life, this community and everything that I'm able to do. So thank you guys again. This is awesome. My email is always open. Shoot me an email. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you guys in the next video. And that is it. I just realized I filmed this whole video without my front headlights on, which is fine, but in case you guys have not seen these before, check them out.